On June 12, 2020, I've enjoyed a delightful day investigating breeding birds with Green Tree naturalist Stefan and Brendan. The Green Tree Foundation property in Manhasset is 400 acres of habitats, including mature woodlands, forest edge, restored grasslands, and an open park. Green Tree provides an absolutely remarkable natural classroom and it's a really special, amazing place of incomparable beauty and value in Nassau County. Ready? Let's enjoy our explorations with Stefan. Good morning, Mary Jean. How are uh, you? Good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> good. We're, uh, we're here at the Green Tree Foundation, and today we're right in the middle of the breeding season for birds, and we're gonna have uh, opportunities to look at birds, a different life cycle or different stages of the nesting. And uh, we're right here at the entrance near one of the buildings. And we already have these opportunities. Uh, there's a, a barn swallow that is incubating eggs right against the ledge of the building. They build this little mud nest. Here's one of the parents that just got up. Oh, here's the other. So we're not sure exactly because we can't see into the nest what stage they're at, but based on the fact that they were building the nest last week, uh, there are probably eggs in there and um, they're likely incubating the eggs at this stage. Uh, this box right there is um, uh, man-made, obviously. It's a very pretty one. And uh, it attracts a different species. The barn swallows always build their own mud nests every year. This box is for tree swallows, so uh, a different species of swallows. And uh, we've uh, we've been I've been keeping an eye on them. And uh, let's see if we see some of the parents. They're a little more advanced in their breeding, so um, we can see. Uh, we we'll try to see what they're up to this morning. It's, I really like green tree in the fog. It usually means it's very quiet, no wind. You can really hear the birds. Kind of gives it a, a mystical aspect. The bird didn't go in to feed its chicks. So the chicks are so large that they're waiting for the parents right at the, at the hole opening. And the parents come in and they just very quickly exchanged um, food and fed the chicks and both adults both parents are feeding the chick. So it, it's important when you're observing or looking for bird or searching for bird to listen. Uh, it's particularly important today because there's a fog all around us so we can't see that much, but this is something that we would do anyway. So we can listen um, to the bird singing. We're hearing some, some birds that are typical of this habitat, which is a little bit like in an urban park. We have these uh, tall, mature trees in an area which uh, is as lawn underneath. But there's for some birds, it's quite satisfactory. So birds like robins that we are hearing. Uh, we hear some red-winged blackbirds. The whistle is a red-winged blackbird. Uh, there's a warbling vireo singing in the, in the distance. We also heard a yellow warbler. All of this we are able to gather all this information just from listening. Uh, there's an important link with the breeding. Um, most of these birds that are singing now are males and they're singing um, to indicate to other conspecific that this is their territory, that this is their piece of land. And at this, by this time, they've attracted a female, most of them and the female has built a nest somewhere in that territory. So there's a lot of meaning to these birds singing. Um, and it also, for a survey point of view, allows us very easily to tell which species is singing and where. If there's activity around the nest, we should see it. Let's go to the other nest first. So it's right in this tree, right here, somewhere in the middle. But I spent 15 minutes yesterday looking for it. Mm. I just couldn't come up with it. Maybe the leaves grew a little more since I found it. And it's a little more hidden. Or... Got a raven calling. 
Good. Good ears. So birds teach us lots of things and one is to be good listeners, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> that is a uh, not for debate. Orchard Oriole nest. And it is in this black cherry right here. It is uh, one of the lowest clump of leaves to the left of the tree, almost like relative to the trail, it's lined up here, there's a clump that's almost vertical, and that's what the nest is in there. It's a little dome. So, you know, we, we flushed her, but she came back quickly to the nest. So now we're gonna get away. The, there are a lot of predators for these nests. Uh, blue jays are astute uh, student of, <laughs> of other, bird, uh, other, other birds looking for nests and they'll eat the chicks too which is quite yeah. gruesome but um that's how it is out there that's um they it's an important source of food for blue jays at this time of the year they also have their own fledglings to feed um, so we're gonna step away and uh, uh, prevent that from happening so the, the reason why we're doing breeding bird surveys in june is because the migrant birds have gone through by now. Uh, maybe the first few days of June, there are still a small number of migrants coming through, but we're June 12th today and uh, all the birds uh, have, have gone through. So we're sure now that these birds are not migrant. Uh, it's not completely black and white in terms of, of the, uh, this is the bird we're looking for here. Um, it's not black and white in terms, birds are always on the move and some birds which might lose their nests in one area are going to wander to other areas to perhaps try to breed again. So it doesn't mean that there's absolutely no bird movement, but migration per se is over and this is why we're here today to do a breeding bird survey. Yeah, you're very aware of the timing of things as you gather your data, right? Because you, you want this to be accurate, you want it to inform I guess policy, conservation, so gathering the data points are important? Yeah, and for uh, breeding birds, uh, it's particularly important in that context. You need quality habitat. These birds have requirements to breed. If they're not going to meet, find the areas to be appropriate for their nesting, they're just not going to breed. So uh, the fact that they're breeding here is, is important. It's indicative of uh, of the quality of the habitat for each one of those species. Uh, there's a lot of variation in terms of those requirements. Here we're in an open type habitat, a little bit what you would encounter in, in your local park, for example. Those are the types of birds we're seeing here, but later we'll be in the forest, and here is a decent sized forest for, for Long Island. And uh, we're gonna see different species in that area. So uh, yeah, absolutely. The numbers, we do counts as well, so both the diversity and the number of birds presence are both indicators of quality of habitat. And um, if we do this over time, we can pick up trends in terms of the number of birds that are breeding here. Uh, this is not done here, but this is done all over the world and in North America. There are many, uh, many ways in which breeding bird surveys are conducted. Um, what are we looking at? We're looking at a robin's nest with a bird on it. Um, robins make a very obvious nest and they, they will nest in your backyard, your park. Um, it can nest on a forest edge, but uh, they're one of the easiest birds to find. And there's a lot of neat things about um, the breeding of, of robins. Um, they, one of the things is they have multiple broods in a year. And by today, June 12, a lot of the broods have fledged in the last few days. And this one is still sitting on the nest. So I think what's happening here is that this either is a, res um, is a later nest, either the result of that bird's nest being predated earlier, or it's already done with its cycle, with the first brooding, and it's, this is their second nest. We're listening to an Eastern Phoebe and we saw it. Um, it's a type of flycatcher. It's very common inland, but it's a, almost, I would say, borderline rare breeder 
in or very localized breeder in Nassau County. I've been doing bird surveys here at Green Tree for five years, and this is only the second territorial birds bird that we've had. Um, we're here around the Whitney uh, house, the main house. It's a beautiful location, and there are literally hundreds of nooks and crannies throughout the house, little ledges here that this bird could use to nest. It is an example of a species that has adapted very nicely to uh, human encroachment. Uh, for this bird, this is fantastic, right? So we have lots of green areas and we have these multiple areas where the bird can nest. So a very neat, unique site for uh, Nassau County, uh, quite common again inland, but uh, it's a neat observation for us. I've spent a lot of time trying to understand what this, if this bird was bring, uh, breeding or what it was doing, as um, Brendan was explaining in terms of finding breeding evidence to confirm it, but I, I've not seen anything. I've looked for the nest independently, I've followed this bird, I've probably watched this bird for two hours over different days so far, and I've come up empty. Um, I've had lots of luck with other birds by using the same technique, being quiet, uh, following the birds, looking at the bird, looking at its behavior, see if it's gathering nest material, see if it's gathering food, but nothing. This bird is around, really great possibility in terms of breeding. Uh, he's been singing, so he's been territorial, saying like this is his area, um, advertising for other Phoebes and for females, but I just need to keep looking. It's possible that he doesn't have a mate, but now that it's been so long that he's been here, it seems that likely that he would have a mate. That's why he's sticking around at a Baltimore Oriole nest. And Baltimore Orioles weave this basket. So the females weave a basket that's very intricate. There's an inner part to the nest in addition to what you see on the outside. Uh, it can take the female two weeks hmm. to build that nest. And it is literally hanging. Um, it's very, um, complex in the way it's built and probably quite comfortable for for the nestlings and uh, what we hear is the male uh, singing uh, we heard it once before and the female is currently on the nest so that's the Baltimore Oriole so there's a habitat shift here Stefan we're in a different yeah, so area of green tree so we're at the edge of one of the oldest groves in the, on the property. Some of these trees are over 200 years old, some of the old oaks. So we're uh, entering a different habitat. But the species that we're looking at actually feeds um, on the ground. So it's a good example of how edge of forests have a very high diversity. So you could have the species that breed in the forest, or you could have the species that, uh, I should say the species that breed and forage in the forest, but we also have species that breed on the edge of the forest, but will forage in the more open area. So we're gonna look for that bird right now. Mm -hmm. So migrating birds, yes, but today we're doing nest watch to talk about breeding. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the breeding cycle, what you've noticed here, what species, what nest, Sure, and, and habitat is very important. So for breeding, birds are very particular about what they're looking for. So um, some birds have, will be successful in different types of habitats. Robins that we saw, um, they're successful on the edge of the forest. They're successful in manicured area, in your yard, in your local park. Um, other birds will be more restricted to one type but again here, so we're talking about diversity. Green tree is about 50 plus species of birds breeding here, and that's without much water. So that's uh, pretty extraordinary from, from that point of view. Uh, and some of them will be restricted to the forest. So we're talking about scarlet tanagers and eastern wood peewees. Um, those birds prefer to be in the forest. Uh, even birds like chickadees and tufted titmouse, hairy woodpecker certainly, great horned owls um, are a breeder here. So um, those 
require that on, on, a, on a I should say wood thrush so wood thrush is one of the species that breed here that is actually not doing well that is declining loss of habitat is certainly one of one of the the reasons why so here at green tree there's somewhere between 15 and 25 territorial males which is a really nice population and they like this broadleaf deciduous forest with really thick um, uh, leaf litter so they they feed in uh, on the ground in that leaf litter which has a lot of insects and it's interesting because robins and wood thrush are related and wood thrush is a species that still needs that really pristine forest habitat with the, that leaf litter robin is related but it it's one that has done very well where humans have impacted the environment this has not stopped robins for thriving quite the opposite so there are worms they love worms uh, earthworms robins there are earthworms in the woods there are earthworms in the grass on the lawns there are earthworms everywhere at green tree it's got that really moist soil everywhere so robins are, have been able to adapt and they do very well there uh, many many dozens of robins nesting here wood thrush is restricted to that so we can see with this that certain bird species have adapted very nicely to human encroachment they don't look at it at human encroachment they look at it as an opportunity other species like the wood thrush has not made that that adaptation it's usually linked with feeding um, uh, their ability to get the food they need and the adaptive the adaptations they've made uh, specific to that species some species are able to modify do some modification to their to the, to their behavior or to their nesting sites that adapt very nicely to human encroachment and other species are unable to do that and so we've walked about 200 feet in the forest uh, we can see it's extremely shaded in here we have those tall canopy trees and we're hearing a species uh, hairy woodpecker which uh, requires uh, or much prefers those uh, mature forest we just saw the adult woodpecker fly over and it if you look around in the foliage the visibility is is very low but the when the adult which is calling right now got to the nest the chicks got so loud and uh, uh, it's it is like a beacon for us to find nest and confirm nesting so uh, woodpeckers are extremely loud once they hatch out and are probably at least a, a week old in the nest they just get they're just constantly um you know calling out to their parents for, for food um hairy and downy woodpeckers they just they sound mechanical they're just like beep 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 just <laughs> continuously so they're very easy to find they like a radar in um, the forest listening is the sense that you want to use for birds and you use uh, observation site almost as a second secondary uh, to confirm it when you get closer to see the birds but first listening is is the primary sense for detecting birds and the confirming breeding we're, we're hearing uh, this bird called blue-gray gnatcatcher it's a little nasal call <laughs> it is the smallest bird in the forest and it is currently in the tallest tree in the forest and I'm standing right underneath it and I must be 125 feet away from it. Here we are at the vernal pond and we just flushed a great horned owl. We're in the walled garden now and we've seen nests before in the forest on the forest edge now we're going to see a, a nest of a song sparrow which is actually in the grass this is grass that was planted here for the ornamental part of the garden but it is a species that uh, nest in grass whether it, it could also nest in, in wild grasses so uh, i'm going to take you to the nest now uh, it is right here in this edge row and we'll have to look Straight down at the nest. If you look right in here in the little opening, 
there's one chick in the nest. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, group behavior and how that helps a bird species survive? Uh, sure, uh, we can start. There are some starlings behind us. And uh, we really the first social behaviors uh, with the bird starts with the family group. So once the nestlings fledge, uh, they uh, are really, their interactions really depend on the parents. So at that point, they are fed and they get used to their surroundings. The next step for these birds is to start learning to forage on their own. And that is when this group behavior starts to form and it benefits is that uh, birds like starlings learn from each other so they can mimic each other. If they see that a bird is successful. They uh, will try and not just the locations, where the bird is foraging, but perhaps the techniques that the other birds are, are, are using and they will be mimicked. So that's the first, first step. The next step is for the parents to leave those young. Sometimes they will have multiple broods in the summer. So they will leave those young to fend for themselves. Oftentimes those young from different broods gather together. So that's the next step in their social behavior. They continue to learn from each other and they can also get protection in numbers. By the end of summer, all the breeding is done and a new type of association is, takes place, it's sometimes referred to as staging, where all the birds from a given species in a given area gathers and they accumulate in numbers and they will stay in the area and they will keep foraging and it's called staging, really staging for migration. And of course, that's the next step in the type of benefits that the birds get. And they will flock, they will fly south. It's their first migration for those young birds. They can get various benefits at that point. Certainly um, traveling with experienced birds that have been there before, so they can just follow their lead. Although in many species, it's been shown that the birds know, even if they're on their own, where to go. They could still be benefits from traveling with others in that way. And again, the benefits of traveling in groups, uh, protection in numbers. So there's, there's a lot of benefits associated with birds being gregarious and accumulating. And, and that's an example of the progression from the time the bird is born to their first migration and then the cycle is repeated. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Experience um, does help me understand and appreciate what I'm seeing, but really anyone can take the time to look at these birds. And some of this is quite intuitive. And just by being observant, regardless of the experience you have, it could be the first time you look at a woodpecker nest and make some really revealing observation for yourself. Um, uh, for you, for the, the kids, um, really the key, and anyone can do this, is to be observant and patient and appreciate what you're looking at. And then anybody can also, I mean, with the, uh, there's so many good websites now, uh, anybody, mm -hmm. you don't even need a field guide anymore to do your research or mm -hmm. books. You can just go and, um, and, and Google woodpecker nest and mm -hmm. get a lot of information and that's what i do mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, even with with years of experience and and the atlas i'm looking at species that i don't know that much actually because we're interested in looking at every species for the purpose of the atlas so i'm learning a lot so uh, anyone um, it can appreciate this and can learn and can contribute through the atlas as brendan was was mentioning weather this morning with the fog yeah um it's i really like green tree in the fog it usually means it's very quiet no wind you can really hear the birds kind of gives it a, a mystical aspect did it leave with, it